So as we come now to a time to dig a little deeper into God's Word uh, and to further the lesson that Michelle uh, shared with the children, I think it's important for us to understand that the church in Rome, like so many of the early congregations that were founded by Paul, was a church that was made up of both Jewish and Greek individuals. So what, we might say. What's the big deal about that? All of our churches have, since the time of Christ have had a diversity of individuals. And that really is um, something that we need to grasp by understanding the significance of it because the Apostle Paul was a man who firmly believed that one of the greatest arguments for the validity of the Christian faith was Christianity's ability to bring people together, people from all segments of society people that would normally be estranged from each other. And in Christ, he insisted that those societal barriers, those cultural barriers, those political barriers, were simply barriers that were broken down. And the unifying of peoples from all manner of groups was both a preview of heaven and also a practical means to bring peace on earth, representing the love of Christ for all people. The proof of Paul's belief, uh, the hard evidence of his thought in this, was the local gathering of believers which operated on the basis of mutual love. Love between people whose only common denominator was their standing in Christ, their relationship to Christ, their calling Christ their Savior and their Lord, and believing in a pattern of faith and teaching that followed His commands. The situation dealing, uh, that Paul is dealing with in the Roman conversation is uh, one that has practicalities uh, that just cannot be ignored, uh, things that need to be addressed. Because while the walls between diverse groups theoretically had been broken down in and through Christ, people practicing the faith early on uh, understood that there was a construction project going on, but they were just as adept at putting up the walls that had been broken down as soon as they got a chance to revisit things and to interject their interest in their uh, own personal opinions. Paul uses two examples. Neither of these examples seem very important to us. They don't really uh, get to our heart without us digging a little bit deeper and understanding the implications of the symbols and the terminology that he's using. But we do need to simply begin by saying it might not be important to us. We can't really grasp it, but it was very important to the members of the church in Rome. And he talks to them about food. After talking to them about food, he talks to them about holy days. And so for us to grasp this a little bit more and understand its greater implications for our application in our faith journey, let's look at this uh, passage from Romans chapter 14 in, in different segments. We're going to start to unpack today's New Testament reading by just looking at the first five verses of the 14th chapter. He says, Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat, for God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on servants of one another? It is before their own Lord that they stand or fall, and they will be upheld, for it is the for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. So there were in the church those who Paul describes as weak in the faith. And by this terminology, what he means is that there were those people who had areas of immaturity in their faith, in their relationship to Christ, they were not well developed or further along. And subsequently, um, there were others in the church that were maybe stronger and more mature. And this was particularly evident in those um, who felt that it was necessary to, main, 
to maintain certain rules, to maintain certain regulations in their Christian lives that were neither taught nor encouraged by Christ Himself. For example, there were those who came from a Jewish background, and they might be very strict with uh, their observations, very fastidious in their practice and observance regarding eating habits. No doubt this was an attitude related to the dietary laws that had been part of their religious heritage from the earliest of its days. They would never eat certain animals, and others they would eat only if they knew that it was killed and butchered in accordance with the Torah, with the law. And because they lived in areas that they could not be sure about the suitability of the meat that was available for, for consumption, some had simply taken the position to say this, we don't know where it's come from, so we're not going to eat it at all. We're going to just stay away from it. That way we will not um, involve ourselves in any unintentional violation of Torah observance. It was a safety measure, a safety net. And this position, while understandable, was not scriptural and moreover was very hard for those of different backgrounds to grasp and to understand and to even accept. You see, they, these others were used to buying meat in the um, area from merchants who had obtained it from pagan temples after the animal had been offered as a sacrifice to the temple gods. You see, in that day and time, the priests of these other religions would keep some of the sacrificed meat for themselves. It was part of the economy and how it worked at that point in time. It was part of these other priests' income and how they obtained part of how they would sustain their own families. The rest of the meat that was sacrificed would be sold to nearby merchants, and pious Jews and concerned Jewish Christians were absolutely appalled and aghast that they would be uh, simply distraught at the thought that they might be eating something that had been part of a pagan festival and a pagan rite and a pagan sac sacrifice. So they soothed, soothed their minds. Pardon me, get my tongue tied here a little bit. They soothed their minds and dealt with their scruples by abstaining from consumption of such products. Meanwhile, there were other believers from other backgrounds that had no such problem. To them, Meat was meat, nothing more, nothing less. It seems to me that there's a memory recalling some old commercial that had a tagline that simply said, parts is parts, but I, digress. but I digress. But meat was meat to these people, and to these believers, the fact that it had possibly been a part of a pagan temple uh, sacrifice in no way, shape, or form altered the fact that it was what it was. Meat was meat. Additionally, they felt that it was the best meat in town. I mean, after all, if it was good enough to be brought to a sacrifice, right, it had to be good quality. So those two vastly different attitudes, to eat meat or not to eat meat, it created a situation that had high volatility in the church because those who felt free to eat sometimes were treated by their, by their brothers and sisters with contempt, while those who practice a more conscientious attitude and action, uh, they were highly critical of those who were more free. And this criticism and this contempt, um, well, it created tension and it was unacceptable in the fellowship of believers. So Paul sets out to deal with both of these attitudes, and he chooses to do so not in two conversations, but bringing them back uh, in dealing with them in the same uh, fashion, in the same form. Uh, two birds with one stone is one way that we say it. You see the same kind of conflict swirled around the issue of the commemoration of days and the calendar. Jewish practitioners were reverent for the Sabbath, and that um, reverence was so profound that they hedged it in and hemmed it in with so many rules and regulations, making sure that they would not violate the Sabbath laws by chance or by accident. The result of their attention to minute detail became a kind of tyranny which they applied to all, even those who 
had a more relaxed approach uh, than their uh, deeply held convictions, and they resented this. Some have experienced this not in religion, but in uh, leisure activities. Maybe you're a golfer. Maybe you have a group of golfers that always want to play it down, play it as it lies. And maybe you have another group of golfers that says, oh, tater knob it, roll it. Make sure you find a, a good lie so you can get a good swing. They're not so concerned about playing by PGA regulations. We're all amateur golfers after all, right? Well, some of that same kind of attitude had remained for some of the believers. And it's not hard to imagine that feelings would be stirred that feelings and, and rage would be stoked by these different views and the difference in the observance of the Lord's Day and the, and the particulars about how that ought to happen. One solution for the early church would have been to simply put the strict rules people in one group and the loose rules people in a separate group. Keep them away from each other and keep the peace, right? But to do this would not only have been a concession to human stubbornness, it would have also, and probably likely more importantly, robbed the body of Christ of its unique characteristic to operate by unity in the midst of diversity. So in addressing this, Paul steps headlong uh, into requiring the believers to first and foremost act out of conviction not convention. So we're going to look a little bit further in, into the 14th chapter at verses 6 through 9 where Paul says, Those who observe the day observe it in honor of the Lord. Also those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord since they give thanks to God, while those who abstain, abstain in honor of the Lord and giving thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves and we do not die to ourselves. If we live we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So, then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again so that He might be Lord of, of both the dead and the living. You see, the difference is whether the forces at hand are external forces or internal forces. Paul wants the believers to deal with their controversial issues on the solid basis of their commitment to Christ. Uh, on commitment to Christ, pardon me, let me get the T on the end of that. Wants them to deal with it in their commitment to Christ. Nothing more, nothing less. Their differing practices do not bother him, so long as they do it in light of Christ's lordship, Christ's reign, in and over their lives. And second, Paul requires them to terminate their criticism of one another. Verses 10 through 13, as we continue to look at this chapter, read this way. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each of us will be accountable to God. Let us therefore no longer pass judgment on one another, but resolve instead to put a stumbling block or a hindrance in the way of another. Usually when tensions arise concerning, concerning deeply held traditions and convictions, Reactions are usually quite extreme. We can predict this. This is when people dig in their heels. This is when people ready themselves for battle. But Paul condemns this pattern, this pattern of criticism saying that we are all uniquely and ultimately responsible to the Lord. He is the one who will judge each of us. We should not busy ourselves with trying to do God's job. And third and finally, Paul simply requires believers to see and respect the other point of view, the opposing point of view. Look through the eyes of someone else. Verse 14, our final verse this morning says this, I know and I am persuaded 
in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks of it unclean. And so fundamentally, there are going to be differing points of view, green grapes or red grapes. Well, maybe even more important than that in the body of Christ. But these differing points of view should all be respected because it all goes back each and every time in each and every circumstance to the greatest common denominator we share. Paul says it so well. If we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. And whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. Friends, May we go in grace and peace this week, knowing this promise, knowing this teaching, and being better for it. Thanks be to God, and amen.